Good evening. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California, and this is the 18th anniversary of the murder of John Kennedy, the assassination of John Kennedy, November 22nd, 1963. There was an article in our local paper out here, the San Francisco Chronicle and Examiner, Dallas UPI story, prayers for a JFK at assassination site. And it tells about researchers whose lives are dedicated to the investigation of the assassination of President John Kennedy. Plan a moment of silent prayer this morning at 10.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time in Dealey Plaza, 18 years to the minute after the president's slang. A small group of assassination investigators and researchers, including Penn Jones, Gary Shaw, and Gary Mack, make an annual visit to the site on November 22nd, 1963. Penn Jones was quoted as saying, We have a moment of silent prayer. He was the editor of a newspaper, The Midlothian, from its was from Midlothian, Texas, and he's had a newsletter for uh, assassination researchers, the continuing inquiry, ever since he stopped his regular small newspaper in Texas. Uh, he had them going simultaneously for a while, and he continues with the newsletter. He had comments to say about the assassination and the research, and he goes to that site, as the article stated, every single year. Penn is the kind of person who does not uh, just select a certain day, a certain time to uh, understand who was behind the killing of John Kennedy and that terrible assassination. He is the kind of person who has worked continuously, as I have done and as a few of us have done, for 18 years. And I do mean continuously almost every single day. It has been a part of our life for the past 18 years. I first learned about Penn, uh, I started my research November 23rd, actually, 1963, a day after the assassination. I learned about Penn when we were doing an article for Ramparts magazine that was way back in 1966. He did a large section in that uh, article. It was put together by David Welsh on the uh, mysterious deaths of primary witnesses from 1963 until 1966 and how they were dying. The article listed a lot of researchers who were busy at the time. Sylvia Marr, Maggie Fields, who went under the, under the name Margie Deschamps. She didn't want to use her name, Maggie Field. Ray Marcus, David Lifton, Elizabeth Stoneboro, Paul Hawk, Vincent Salandria, Harold Feldman, Mark Lane, Harold Weisberger, Leo Savage, Shirley Martin. Uh, David Welsh was at my home in Carmel when this was about ready to go to print, and I asked him to take my name off of that list of sleuths, even though I helped with the article that was in Ramparts. And the reason I wanted my name off was that most of those people from uh, 1963, November 63, up to 1966, we're working with the ballistics, the gunshots, the evidence of the conspiracy, a lot of the area of the material witnesses. And what I was doing was working with the contacts of Lee and Marina Oswald with an agency in 1966, I already realized, was the highest level of Nazi intelligence, and I didn't want to tangle with any more people coming around the house and bothering me with the area that I was working than I had to do. So I uh, actually was the first one to make the connections, and I'm going into that much more detail this evening. The first person in the United States to make the connections of the Nazis and the role of the German Nazis to the overthrow of this country by killing John Kennedy and then later uh, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. But by 1966, I was well aware that George de Morenschild, a Nazi during World War II, against the United States for the Germans, who also worked uh, right along and closely with the Rockefellers and Chase Manhattan and the network of Hitler's intelligence chiefs. He was the benefactor to Lee and Marina Oswald when they arrived in this country from the Soviet Union in June of 1962. So I asked him to please pull my name out of the article until I could get to the point where I was satisfied to say the things I'm saying this evening and have as little hassle as possible in the meantime. I did help with a lot of material in that article. Uh, if you have the old ramparts, it's on page 50. Uh, the section I helped write was about the evidence that was disappearing. This was two years after the murder of John Kennedy, and in a, uh, 
I made a statement. It is time to reopen the investigation. It is time that the impressive quantity of missing evidence be found and the mountain of withheld evidence be declassified. Among the missing evidence were color frames of the color motion picture that was taken the day that John Kennedy was murdered. Photographs were undeveloped and turned to the Secret Service and not used by the Warren Commission. Uh, the Abraham Zabruder film, as well as that being rearranged and sections being missing. There was the clothing um, of John Connolly that was uh, sent to the dry cleaner and destroyed. The Stemmons Freeway sign in front of the book depository, the street lamp near where the president was shot that would have showed that, showed that there were more bullets, the manhole cover uh, that could have been hit by bullets, that was missing after the assassination. Jacqueline Kennedy's testimony about her husband's wounds was missing, and locked up in the National Archives was about one-third of the information that was relative to solving this crime. I also talked about the White House taking the interior of the president's limousine, cutting it up and destroying it, and that now is on exhibit at the Ford Motor Company in Detroit, Michigan, the car that John Kennedy had without the interior, to show if there was uh, the use of silencers during the crossfire, more bullets in the car that most people couldn't hear. Uh, I talked about the uh, uh, destruction of Dr. Hume, the autopsy papers of Dr. Hume, the original autopsy papers on John Kennedy, and also the post office box application that Oswald filled out in the name of Heidel, which I don't believe he had, that the rifle allegedly came to from Chicago. My contribution to that article in 1966 was the missing evidence, that piece, and I met Penn Jones through the Rampart's work. The uh, series of programs I've had on KLRB the past 11 years, starting with the Pentagon Papers, the disclosure of the escalation of the war two days after John Kennedy was killed, was my introduction to radio work talking about the assassination and evidence of other conspiracies related to this particular John Kennedy assassination. I began studying that in November of 1963, and then I began to study what preceded it in terms of our American history and, of course, what's followed since, because the murder of John Kennedy was not an isolated event. It fell into a time slot where there were many deaths before and many to follow afterwards, and all with a single purpose. And, of course, when the House Select Committee on Assassinations finished their work in 1979 on KLRB, I talked about the area that they left off at, and that was program number 370. We're up to number 520 this evening. And uh, I, the program was about where the committee critics are now, and it was the anti-Castro Cubans or a runaway faction of the Bay of Pigs group, possibly with the organized crime syndicate. And I went on to explain on that particular tape, the broadcast, that the truth of the assassination goes into Division 5 of the FBI, into Navy intelligence, into the defense industry, and then into Interpol, and the Nazi connections of J. Edgar Hoover to Meyer Heydrich, or the Nazi, the head of the uh, extermination program, and Martin Bormann, and the Argentine connections from Argentine to Minsk, Russia, to New Orleans, into New Jersey. And I mentioned New Jersey, and this is very important for what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, and Houston and Dallas, those connections. The Interpol, the Nazi links of J. Edgar Hoover, to Heydrich, to Martin Bormann, to Argentine, to Minsk, to New Orleans, to New Jersey, Houston, Texas, and Dallas. Now, there were other cities that played an important part in this, such as Rome or in California, but the if you took a map of the world and had to mark these particular areas that were so terribly important, Miami was also important, but the keys were the Argentine, Minsk, New Jersey, Houston, Dallas, and the keys were the links of the FBI, our FBI, to the Nazis and to Martin Bormann down in South America. And that was a clue to where to look for the conspirators and their paths or their modus operandi. Before we get on to that subject in more detail, I did get a letter this week from a gentleman from the United States Army Special Forces, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 
and he asked me, Dear Mrs. Brussel, please let me know if your most informative tapes are for sale to the public. I had occasion to listen to one a week ago and would like to get them, if at all possible. Sincerely, Captain Ward from Greensboro, North Carolina. Also, send any literature you have on the assassinations. Thank you. That comes one week or several days after being on the same airplane with E. Howard Hunt, and there were allegations that E. Howard Hunt recruited at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for part of the assassination team that was used to kill John Kennedy. What I might answer to Captain Ward, I haven't answered the letter yet, is, Dear Captain, I'd like to refer you to a letter I got in January um, 17, 1974, from a Mr. Frankenberry, James Frankenberry, who worked at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I described this on a tape in July 1980 and several times before that Mr. Frankenberry had worked at Fort Ord, California. He was supposed to go to Germany and um, Latvia and then to the USSR for an assassination case for the Defense Department. But he was sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he was placed in a special unit, and he was working with men who would be involved in the attempted shooting of, Lute- of Major General Edwin Walker in April of 1963 and would be involved in the crossfire of shooting President John Kennedy November 22, 1963. James Frankenberry claims that he was meeting somebody who he believed was E. Howard Hunt, and Hunt was recruiting these people from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. This is interesting because the last, oh, weeks and weeks I've been talking about Edwin Wilson and Frank Turpel, who recruited from North Carolina to send assassination teams over to Gaddafi and Libya, and that they were working directly with the CIA and Defense Department. I'm sure that what Captain Ward got was a tape mentioning North Carolina and Wilson and Turple and that outfit that I will pass up this evening and get back to later, but it all ties in to the Kennedy assassination. Uh, we'll put them on the burners temporarily and go to a, another area that is terribly important and a story that just broke this week, Friday, two days before the 18th anniversary of the assassination of John Kennedy. And just before I get to that, there, I do want to say that over the years, people have asked me for books to read to understand who killed John Kennedy. Who, where were the forces behind it? Uh, who had the power to do it? How did they cover it up? If I had limited time and limited money, what would I read? And I have a bibliography if you want it. You can send a self-addressed stamped envelope to me at Box 22511 Carmel, 93922, and I'll send you this sheet because I made this bibliography up in 1974, and it's just as important or more important now for the things that I'm about to tell you than ever uh, you could imagine. I knew it was important, and with all the books out on the assassinations up to that date, and there's been a lot since, I still say in this order that these are the most important things to read, and um, the news that's breaking today goes back to these references. One is the book Project Paperclip by Clarence Lansby, put out by Athenium Press in 1971 with the importation of Nazis into the United States defense factories, the universities, the hospitals, the decision-making policies, into space projects, into the ITT, remember the ITT, into General Motors, the corporations that financed Hitler and Ford Motor Company in Detroit and so forth. This was the bulk of the Nazis who came to the Western world and then all over Europe and South America and Asia and Africa who left Germany when they realized that the war was over. The 1945 Declaration of Peace was long planned for two years, and as soon as the peace treaty was signed, they were brought to this country and spread around the world. And the next uh, book is Kukaric's book, Galen, Spy of the Century, put out in 1971 by Random House, describing Reinhold, Reinhard Galen, Hitler's chief of intelligence, of the Eastern Division who came to the United States to form our CIA and then went back to Germany to head the German intelligence after World War II. And then third, I listed my three articles, Why Was Martha Mitchell Kidnapped? that came out in 1972, the Senate Select Committee as part of the cover-up in 1973, 
and the SLA is the CIA in 1974. Those were published in The Realist and give you an umbrella framework to understand what has happened to America since the end of World War II and even going back farther than that. And of course, Dr. Peter Bragan's work from the Center of the Study of Psychiatry on Psychosurgery, Psychiatry, and Nazism, and Freedom uh, Publications put out by Ra- uh, uh, Vaughn Young in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, the Interpol Connections of the Nazis to J. Edgar Hoover and to the United States government. Those are important articles that um, have to be read in books that have to be read to understand what really has been coming down for the past years. And then finally, I made a list of books for um, a magazine. They asked me to do this assignment. I wrote an article. It was not published, but the article, uh, the essence was, what are the most important books to read to understand who killed John Kennedy? And these are in addition to Project Paperclip and Galen's By the Century. One was Oswald Assassin or Fall Guy, written by jo- Joachim Jostan. I don't, never know if I pronounce his name right. It was written in 1964 and rushed to judgment by Mark Lane, even though I can't stand the guy. It was a good book, and it kept the subject open for a long time. Forgive My Grief, Volume 1, 2, 3, and 4 by Penn Jones, the same gentleman who gave the silent prayer in Dallas today. Document Addendum to the Warren Report by David Lifton. Farewell America by James Hepburn. Who's Who in the CIA by Julius Mader. Nomenclature of Assassination Cabal by William Torbett. And the Assassination of JFK by Coincidence or Conspiracy, Bernard Fensterwald. Now, Fensterwald works with the CIA. He really has been a traitor to the researchers and to American history, but it's a good book. Like Mark Lane's book, it is a good book, and all of these will give you some insight into the murder. Now, this week, as I say, just two days before the anniversary of the death of John Kennedy, a story broke in the San Jose Mercury that will have repercussions all over the world. Uh, This particular writer, his name is Pete Carey, he works for the Mercury, he did a story on Stanford Technology and Frank Turple, that character that I've been talking about for so long, who was on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, if you had the luck to see him on that program. Um, He wrote an article out here on Frank Turple's relationship to Stanford Technology. And I mentioned on this program that once you get Wilson and Turple out here in Palo Alto, with this outfit, with Hewlett Packard, and with the defense industry, you can begin to put the real pieces together of what happened going back uh, many years. But this article is about these particular people and their references on the West Coast. And I was very generous. I offered Pete the Pulitzer Prize. I said, if you want the Pulitzer Prize, go for this story and uh, go out. It's out there in this area. And he went out and he caught the big fish, and it took three or four weeks Uh, to get it together, and I didn't want to say anything on this program until that article was published. It's the San Jose Mercury, November the 20th, 1981, and probably, for all of my research in the past years, it's probably the most important single story to put the pieces together that I've been talking about for so long with you and in my printed articles. The title of the article is Ex-Nazi's Brilliant U.S. Career in a Web of Lies. I wrote down some excerpts of this story for you. I'm going to read them to you and break every once in a while with my own interpretation because for some of you it will have a lot of meaning and for others it may be a little too subtle to appreciate what a bombshell this is going to be for researchers around the country. I spoke to one gentleman who's published about eight books this evening about the story and he already wanted to get Pete a publisher. I'm sure that he will have publishers coming out of the woodwork as he proceeds on this story and articles for many days to come. The story is about a man, Otto Albrecht, Alfred von Bolschwing, B-O-L-S-C-H-W-I-N-G, and I mentioned him on KLRB two weeks ago, but not in relationship to this story, just his work with Adolf Eichmann in the Zionist organizations in Palestine. For the past 10 years, 
the past of Otto Albrecht, Alfred von Wolfsbring is breaking out, according to Pete Carey. He was president of a high technology investment firm with headquarters in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto. That firm was TCI, Trans International Computer Investment Corporation, and it had headquarters both in Silicon Valley and in Sacramento, very close to the governor, um, who was Ronald Reagan in Sacramento. Sacramento was the offices of this computer technology firm, and I believe it was Ronald Reagan was governor, and it went right into his administration and his offices, and I'm sure that's why the headquarters of TCI were up in Sacramento. This particular von Bolschwang is suffering. There's a picture of him. Don't feel too sorry for him. He has, according to the interviews, a rare brain disease that began in 1979. His wife uh, allegedly killed herself in 1978 when the story began uh, to come unglued. And I think about Martha Mitchell and Dorothy Hunt and some of these sacrificial wives. I would love to know more about how Mrs. Von Bolschwing died just when the hot seat is coming down on her husband. He's now, as I say, is suffering what a rare brain disease that started two years ago that hit the brain stem. And it reminds me of the movie The Borgia Stick. When the researchers uh, study that movie, you see that particular agents, when they're close to home uh, and know too much, are put into an institution and become like vegetables or zombies. According to this article, he numbered among his business associates millionaires, bankers, and scientists. And in May 1981, the federal government began proceedings to deport him because he lied about his Nazi past. I don't think he lied. I don't. I just don't think they wanted to deport him. He held on as long as he could, and when his name came up in uh, relationship to another war criminal, they are wanting to deport Mr. Trifia, uh, uh, Richard Nixon's lifelong friend. Uh, then they had to get into the von Bolschwing case. Who is Otto von Bolschwing? This account that Pete Carey wrote is from court records, business files, and people who knew him. He worked for the Americans during World War II and after World War II while the war was going on. Similar to that Carl Wiedenbach I talked about last week, an alias for Colonel Charles Willoughby. He's a German for, who was in charge of U.S. intelligence with Douglas MacArthur. And I have a list of many German Nazis who were working with the United States Army the same time they were working with the Nazis in Germany. One of them, of course, is Henry Kissinger. Otto Albrecht Alfred von Bolschwing was accused by the Justice Department of helping Adolf Hitler's persecution of European Jews. He was not only an associate of Adolf Eichmann, he was a superior and the architect of Germany's mass killing program. Eichmann died in Israel. This fellow's been working and living and just became ill two years ago. He was born October 15, 1909, of East Prussian nobility, an estate founded by his family in 1302. He went to school in Breslau. He was a member of the Nazi Party from the age of 24. That'd be 1933. He joined the SS, the Himmler's secret elite guard of police, six years later in 1939. The Justice Department states that as an SS captain, he helped plan the execution of Jews in Romania, and that goes into his uh, relationship to the Iron Guard, but he excluded Jews from the German economy, and he helped set up a bank in the Netherlands to take the real estate, the homes of the Jews, and give them the lowest price, uh, take their capital and put it in Swiss banks for Nazis. He helped develop anti-Jewish propaganda to force their emigration from Germany. He forced it. He was an SD, which is a foreign intelligence member of the SS, and his cover was an a salesman for the motor trade company. Now, Henry Ford and Porsche and Volkswagen were all heavy into the Nazi regime before and after the war. In 1938, he was in contact with Palestinian Germans. He worked in the Gestapo, and he was doing extramural intelligence activities. He worked with members of the Jewish Haganah, and I've mentioned the Haganah on other tapes and in the book, Treason for My Daily Bread. It's very important to know that the Haganah was the agency that allowed Martin Bormann to go to Palestine and then to South America. And the von Bolschwang had control of the Haganah organization in Palestine that was a cover for uh, Jewish activity, but was 
uh, sending the Nazis out of Palestine into the other parts of the world when the war was over. He was kicked out by the British in 1938 for his Nazi work in Palestine, working with the Grand Mufti over there. And from there he went to Romania where he used different covers as he traveled from car salesman in Palestine to a lawyer in Romania. It was an oil expert in Holland. It was a banker. Later it was selling wine in Argentine. He helped the leadership of the notorious Iron Guard, which was a right-wing movement, and he helped the members after a massacre where thousands of Jews were killed in Romania. There was a three-day rampage of slaughter. He helped those people leave and find life elsewhere. Of course, there is another whole book to be written on Richard Nixon's career with the Iron Guard, with Nikolai Maloxa, Al Valerian, Trefa, Trefia, and Trefa, rather, and this Otto von Bolschwein. He then went to Amsterdam and helped the, as I say, helped the Iron Guard escape from Romania. And then he became a partner in an Amsterdam bank, the Bank Voor Zaken, I can't pronounce that middle name. He played the role of Aryanization, the forced sale of Jewish homes and farms, businesses and securities. And I say the mon money was then sent to Switzerland, where I imagine the Iron Guard could use it to travel to America and South America. After 1945 in Amsterdam, uh, the years from 1941 to 45 are fuzzy. Those are not filled in yet in the article by Pete Carey. He said he was in a Gestapo prison, but there never were any charges or records of files against him. In April 1942, he said he escaped from a Gestapo prison, and that's when he goes to the Americans and, of course, uh, this area of 1941 to 45 is is uh, not recorded in this article. But in 1945, he helped the American troops who entered Austria allegedly catch Nazi officials and SS officials, uh, worked with a U.S. colonel in the 71st Infantry. When the war was over in 1945, von Bolschwang, like many, many of the top Nazi organizers, knocked on the offices on the door of U.S. intelligence and said, I am experienced, I have a ring operating, if you give me a paycheck, I'll make you very happy, and he was sort of a miniature Reinhard Galen, according to the story in the San Jose Mercury. Now, he not only uh, made people very happy, and they not only gave him a paycheck, but he goes on to run a corporation worth $50 million for the Cabot uh, family later in Germany. But he said, I'll make you happy, and at the time... Reinhard Galen was chief of Hitler's Eastern Intelligence, about to come to the United States to form our National Security Council and CIA. So he was a mini Galen, described as a smaller Galen, until he takes over the Galen operation. Otto moves from the SS to the Gestapo, from Hitler's Gestapo, from Hitler's dreaded secret police directly to the Central Intelligence Agency, as did thousands of other Nazis, as I say, who came to this country to hospitals, schools, and agencies to become very wealthy people later. Reinhard Galen built up the spy network in post-war Eastern Europe, and according to one unconfirmed report, and this is in the San Jose Mercury, Otto Albrecht... Alfred von Bolschwing became the controller of Reinhard Galen's CIA operation after Reinhard Galen returned to German government. Now, anybody who has heard me on KLRB or, as I say, read my articles for many years can appreciate receiving this information just it's just 18 years minus two days since the assassination of John Kennedy because I have listed the Galen agents that were responsible that had a part in the assassination of Kennedy. And this Otto von Bolschwein is a man who was over these people who was their superior in the United States and before they came to this country. We'll take a one-minute break and go on to Otto von Bolschwein and the Kennedy assassination. For those of you who have listened regularly through the years or even intermittently to these broadcasts that I've had and the research into the Kennedy assassination, uh, you must be as happy as I am to realize that, that the mini Galen, the man in charge of the Galen operation when Galen went back to Germany to head uh, the German intelligence after World War II, that this man was the controller of the Galen operation. Now, when you say that, you have 
the entire spy network of the assassination teams, the people that have uh, taken over the corporations, perverted the courts, distorted the news, and carried on many, many murders that I have talked about week after week. This fellow, Otto uh, von Volschwang, has to be the top dog over a lot of the intelligence activity. And as I said in the introduction of this program, what turned the story to Otto von Volschwang and the discovery of him was the location of Frank Turple out here in Sunnyvale, California, and Edwin Wilson and Theodore Shackley. Now, there will be years or weeks or months of broadcasts on this subject and books written about this because once this story goes out across the nation and the uh, corporations he worked with and for get linked together to the past era, this will be the beginning of a new awareness of people who've been doing research all these years. I'll continue with what was in the article by Pete Carey to show you how important it is. He put in the sentence that one source said about Otto that when he came to this country, he must have done something right because he had so much uh, uh, clout around him and people of importance. Now, December 1953, von Bolschwang was staying in Europe. He was working for the OSS. The OSS became the CIA in 1947. He worked for the United States government from, I guess, around 1942, 43 until 47 when it was a CIA. And he was the CIA over in Europe until 1953, until December 53, when he applied to emigrate to the United States. Of course, he has all the security to go through. He didn't change his name any more than Joseph Mengele's changes his name when he comes to this country from Paraguay and travels. He used his name, and that isn't an easy name to forget, Otto Albrecht Alfred von Bolschwing. Uh, you could put that through a computer and not find too many of those. February the 2nd, 1954, he arrived in the CIA. He had been working for the government for six years, and no research has been done on this man, even though he didn't use any aliases. He became a United States citizen in 1959, and when he was secure in the United States, then his citizenship took a sudden upward turn. According to Pete Carey in the San Jose Mercury, after he was secure in the United States, his career took a sudden upward turn. He became the assistant to the director of international marketing at Warner Lambert Pharmaceutical Company. Warner Lambert, in case I don't have time to do it this evening, and I'll do it next week, uh, was the company that escalated the career of Richard Nixon. Now, Richard Nixon was fighting Jerry Voorhees in California in 1946. He was brought here. Voorhees was in the House of Representatives trying to break up IG Farben Chemical Company, and Farben had broken itself into hundreds of other concerns that uh, are probably and possibly tied hand in glove with Warner Lambert uh, Company. Uh, we have to look the the relationship of IG to Warner Lambert. I did get information from researchers in Philadelphia when I told them about the article this weekend that Warner Lambert supplied the drugs for Jim Jones down in Jonestown, but that isn't, that isn't even a scratch of the story. He became an assistant to the director of international marketing of Warner Lambert. He developed close ties to the company's president, Elmer Bobst. And Elmer Bobst is the fellow who said to Richard Nixon, come into my office in 1962 when Nixon lost his governor and we'll make you the president. And the only way they had to make him president was to kill John F. Kennedy and Nixon would be riding the saddle within a short time. He had close ties to the honorary board chairman of, War of Warner Lambert, that's former New Jersey Governor Alfred Driscoll. He had international contacts, and this article described his contacts were way out of proportion with his job, way out. From the Gestapo, from Hitler to the CIA to Warner Lambert, the corporation that would make Richard Nixon president after they killed John Kennedy. Now, Alfred Driscoll uh, wrote recommendations for Otto von Bolschwing, Bolschwing, it is not Wang, for years. He's described in Who's Who in America as a graduate of Harvard University, New Jersey Bar, in 1929, a state senator in New Jersey, director of Warner 
Lambert from 1954 to 1971. This is Alfred Driscoll, who was writing recommendations for Otto uh, to give him a nice, cozy comfort until he ends up in California. Uh, uh, this Driscoll was director of a chemical fund in New Jersey. He was on the President's Commission of Intergovernment Relations, a trustee for the Samuel Crest Foundation and Williams College, and a former executive from the State Liquor Administration in New Jersey. That Alfred Driscoll was writing recommendations for Otto, and he was beginning to sail. In 1959, he was linked to Warner Lambert Pharmaceutical and Elmer Bops, and by the mid-60s, now we've got a jump to the mid-60s. Kennedy has been killed. 1959, Lee Harvey Oswald is in Navy intelligence going to the Soviet Union, and the inter connecting links I'll do later. I'll do the biography that was in the San Jose Mercury now. But we jump in this article from 59 to the mid-60s. We have Kennedy dead and LBJN who's going to re resign and not run in 68 and make way for Nixon, Elmer Boss, Bob's uh, protege from Warner Lambert. But this particular article jumps to the mid-60s in 59 with Warner Lambert in New Jersey and uh, in 59 to 60, Nixon was running and campaigning against John Kennedy. In 1960, Nixon lost to John Kennedy. In 1962, Nixon lost as the governor of California. In 1962, Nixon was taken by Elmer Bobst and to Warner Lambert in New York City, and I'm sure this is where Otto von Bolschwang was very instrumental through this whole time period with that corporation and with his Reinhardt Galen link that were involved in the murder of Kennedy that made way for Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. 1963, Richard Nixon put Jerry Ford on the Warren Commission and Jerry Ford uh, covered up Nixon's crimes going back to Dallas and a lot more. Uh, LBJ resigns in 68. Robert Kennedy is killed after he wins the primaries in 68, and Richard Nixon, the protege of Elmer Bobbs and Warner Lambert, is then the president of the United States of America, and Otto von Bolschwang is in California, where Ronald Reagan is the governor, and Otto's next job is to put a secretary for Ronald Reagan to screen his office, and that's Helene von Damm. She's in the White House now, but I'm jumping the article. Let's go chronologically. But just to show you what happened in those mid-60s, while Otto Albrecht, Alfred von Bolschwing was swinging with Warner Lambert and goodness knows who else. Now, Otto became a chief financial officer then for Cabot Manufacturing. It, it had a German subsidiary, and according to this article, $50 million a carbon black factory for Cabot in Germany. I don't know what carbon black factory is, but I know what black carbon is. According to this article, as chief financial officer for the Cabot, Manufacturing in Germany, a subsidiary, Otto von Bolschwing developed a $50 million factory for Cabot in Germany. Now, I don't know whether this is a front, whether it's an espionage operation, whether there is a funding that went into the Permindex operation that was to do all of the multiple assassinations after the 50 when the Cold War really began. There has to be more research done into the Cabot manufacturing and a $50 million factory that von Bolschwang was in charge of. For those of you who might have missed the first half of this program, I might say I am taking excerpts out of an article from the San Jose Mercury this week um, by Pete Carey. It was November the 20th, 1981. If you want the complete article, it's a long article, three pages, incidentally. You can send me, for the copying and the postage, a self-addressed stamped envelope and one dollar, and I will send you the entire article in case I forget it later. It's May Brussel, Box 225-11, Carmel, California, 93922. You should have this uh, article and then look up some of the corporations or the names in here and it will give you a lot of leads and there is material for years to come. The article went on the deal for Otto von Bolschwang to work with Cabot Manufacturing was financed through Thomas Franzioli F-R-A-N-Z-I-O-L-I Senior Vice President of the First National Bank of Boston. So he goes from Himmler's SS and Adolf Eichmann's extermination in Romania and Amsterdam and Palestine into the 
CIA and with Warner Lambert as soon as he becomes a citizen, then with the Cabot Manufacturing in Germany, and then he gets his uh, financing through a Thomas Franzioli. This is the first national bank of Boston, and I have to do a lot of research into the Robert Mayhew, CIA, FBI, Boston Connections, the first national bank in Boston, senior vice president was financing this operation. After Thomas Franzioli made the deal for Otto von Bolschwang from the First National Bank of Boston to be head of the German end of the Cabot Manufacturing, von Bolschwang, according to this article, branched out on his own. One of his businesses was importing wine from Argentina, and you can bet your last bottom dollar that there was the wine that was imported. And the Odessa-Argentine connections of Nikolai Maloxa from the Iron Guard went through Nixon's office in Whittier down to Argentine. And of course, he's back in Germany and he's in Argentina and he's with the National Bank of Boston. Then he makes another jump in 1969. Ronald Reagan is the uh, governor out here in California and Bolschwang is in California. He's now in Sacramento with a corporation. He was retained first. He was retained for an international business consultant for TCI, Transcontinental International Computer Investment Corporation. TCI had been used up in 1967 to monitor the Arab-Israeli war. Its founder was named Oswald, interesting, Oswald S. Williams. And in 1969, they wanted to commercialize their technology. This was the Defense Department. This was the Defense Industry Security Command. These are the satellite systems, that secret, dangerous Silicon Valley headquarters in Sacramento. They were used and monitored for the defense and all the intelligence agencies, the Arab-Israeli War in 67. By 69, they bring Mr. Otto von Bolschwing into their area for international business. They're going to sell their expertise and commercialize on technology that they've developed in Silicon Valley. TCI had two subsidiaries in Palo Alto and Mountain View. I'm not going to go into them tonight, but you will be hearing much more about them and the Wilson Turple collections that later come in. One was the Advanced Information Systems, the AIS, and the other is the International Imaging Systems, the uh, I2S in California. They did high volume and computer network for businesses, for navigation systems, for oil tankers using satellite communications, and they needed Otto von Bolschwang for their international. Now, he could, if he was in charge of the Galen operation, was simply a name on the door. He could be big spy. He has had no satellite communications. They don't have to sell anything. This is top secret military defense. But he begins his trips around Europe for TCI, Transcontinental Computer Investment, and it, then it's very much part of the United States Defense Department. The company had classified work for the Defense Department. It was going to be a sensitive thing, according to one of the people who gave an interview to Pete Carey. We all had security clearances, all but Otto von Bolschwing, who, as I say, was brought in there uh, using his name. He was in the Gestapo. He was in the SS, used his name, and was brought into TCI because they wanted his contacts in Europe which had to be Hitler's, uh, Himmler's Gestapo agents in Europe, he was brought in. TCI memo in 1969 said, Our new consultant, Otto von Bolschwing, has extremely valuable connections and information in Germany, in Switzerland, in Liechtenstein, in the Netherlands, in Til- Antilles, and in South America. You can imagine what kind of connections he had and has. Mr. von Bolschwing's connections in these countries are current. In 1969, those connections were current. And don't forget, in 1969, that's the year that the Nugenhan Bank was started with people that were later to be linked up with von Bolschwing. That was a very important year, 69, because um, the uh, drug traffic, the heroin traffic, the cocaine, the Air America were setting up headquarters with Michael Hand and Frank Nugent, who went from Southeast Asia and used their bank for $55 million to $1 billion, which is still missing. All CIA money, all narcotics money, all kill money 
responsible in funneling down to Chile, to colonial dignity, to the murder of um, uh, Yende, to the overthrow of the government in Chile. Uh, this story has tentacles that go on and on. But in 1969, they were getting their muscles, and they brought him in for these countries. And he had contacts. This article is so magnificent. He had contacts with the German branch of the Chase Manhattan Bank. So he's got the Boston banks, the Chase Manhattan, Argentine, and every major country that's involved in these conspiracies. One owner of a bank in Berlin, in, or in Frankfurt, rather, one of the largest banks in Frankfurt, he had uh, very close connections in Frankfurt and with the German branches of the Chase Manhattan. The directors of the TCI Corporation said that von Bolschwing's contacts were very important. Now, who were the board of directors? John Paul Getty, Jr., the son of the oil millionaire. Von uh, Getty liked von Bolschwing so much, he made him the president of TCI in 1970. This computer business, as I say, don't forget the subsidiaries. They'll come out later. The Advanced Information Systems and International Imaging Systems. Otto von Bolschwang was, uh, started as a consultant, became the president, and traveled to Europe with various people. By 1970, Oswald Williams uh, and the others had acknowledged that John Paul Getty had made him the president of TCI. Walter F. Leverton was on the board of directors of TCI. He was former vice president for satellite systems of the Aerospace Corporation. Judge William Newsom, first district court of appeals in San Francisco, traveled to Europe with Otto von Bolschwing in 1969 to 1970. He was the attorney for TCI. Newsom described him as having all the right credentials. Emmanuel Sanakis was a former vice president of Fairchild. He resigned from the ITT. He was an officer with ITT. He worked with Philco and with Ford Aerospace. One of the most important names in this is Emmanuel Senecas, spelled F-T-H-E-N-A-K-I-S. He is the link to Aristotle Onassis, Halmar Schacht, Otto Skorzeny, the people who were training Nasser, who were training Sadat, training Gaddafi. This is why Wilson and Turpel and the men I've been talking about week after week have put Nazis into the governments in the entire Middle East, training the PLO. This Sanakas was the link to Onassis and to the other Nazis from Madrid and Argentine that set up the Central America, South America, Middle East Nazi connections. Sanakas as I say, was former vice president of Fairchild. He resigned from IDT. The You know that corporation. If you don't know it, get your books on ITT. I'll give you more in the weeks to come. He traveled to Europe with von Volschwang. He was active, as I say, in Philco and in Ford Motor. And this opens up a whole story of Chile, Allende, Colonia Dignitad, and the overthrow of Allende for Pinochet, putting those Nazis in power. Remember when Allende was murdered, the swastikas came out. Uh, he talked about his working for United States intelligence when he was with Senecas, and they took trips, and they were on the board directors together, and uh, this was Otto von Bolschwang linked to some more important people. Now, in the secretary for TCI, the woman who translated the German-American correspondence, and you better believe there was a lot of it, was Helene von Damm, V-O-N-D-A-M-M. And when Pete called me and, and asked me, what do you know about Helene? I got out my file on Helene. He said, what do you know about Warner Lambert? I got my file on Warner Lambert. As he came to these names, I could go to my research, and that I was very proud that after 18 years of studying who murdered John Kennedy, I had accumulated thousands and thousands of files on all these people and could relate them to Dallas, how the murder came down, who was behind it. So he asked me about Helene Von Dom. She was a translator for TCI who worked with Emmanuel Sanakas and Onassis and for Judge Newsom and the Getty family and the ITT connections. And she came from Europe, worked with um, Otto von Bolschwing is probably part of the Gestapo and certainly part of the Reinhard Galen operation, came from Austria and went to Detroit, Michigan, where so many of them went. 
and worked for AMA, which had to be a job or an offshoot of the Warner Lambert Pharmaceutical. And she heard Ronald Reagan giving a speech. And at anyone who campaigned to be governor of California, she would have been their secretary. She was brought out to TCI in California, in Sacramento, and became the secretary for Ronald Reagan. Well, we had that bloodbath in California when there was shooting at Isla Vista. If he said there's going to be a bloodbath, bring it on. The People's Park, the prison riots, the racism, the putting down of the United Farm Workers, um, the blacks, the Black Panthers, the bloodbath that we had here, that craziness, Oregans, uh, was happening with these top Nazis advising him and his staff and placing real Nazis, I mean real Himmler, Eichmann, Gestapo Nazis throughout the state of California. Ms. Von Don was a translator for TCI and became the secretary of Ronald Reagan. And when Ronald Reagan became president of the United States, who do you think was the secretary sitting at the office? Who do you think sits at the Oval Office right next to him, who screens every appointment he makes? Helene Von Dahm, and I have an article of, of how she selects appointments for the Ronald Reagan administration. If you thought the name sounded too German for Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan, think again, because Otto von Volschwang and Reinhard Galen have to be behind the whole era that masterminded also the murders of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy that made the election of Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon possible. When they got rid of John, Nixon came in, they got rid of Robert, and Reagan came in, and they got what they wanted, and now we've got what we didn't want and don't know the difference. She was a translator for TCI. She invested in this corporation, and she was Ronald Reagan's secretary in Sacramento, and many of his administration and the people around Reagan were involved in TCI. Now, something happened. They got into trouble in 1970. This corporation um, was forced to go under and fold because many of the stockholders from over the world uh, were syndicating their stock. They were selling it to other small investors in Sacramento, and they overstepped their uh, bridges too far. Now, the problem was that uh, they got in trouble with the law, but not enough. And I venture to ask how many of you people ever read anything about this suit of TCI that went on in Sacramento at the time. What they did, they had to fold up and close office, but they retrenched into other activities and became very active in Silicon Valley and these other corporations. Uh, Brian Van Camp, an attorney for TCI, said uh, prosecuting it, said it was the hottest thing in town. The trading was illegal under a 1968 law that required security sales as registered. They got in trouble, and it was also described in Sacramento as the largest stock fraud in California history. And you know that even at that date, uh, the Getty name and Otto von Bolschwang was kept out of the newspaper, even though he used his own name and people were writing books about him and his role with Adolf Eichmann. Um, this largest stock fraud in California history was literally kept out of the news when TCI fell apart. They broke up that particular little group, and uh, Helen Von Dahm kept her place working for Ronald Reagan and worked up to the White House. But in 1972 to 78, there was a shuffling of their papers, and the corporation known as TCI suspended their trainings. As I say, described as the biggest stock fraud in California history, and you never see the name of Otto von Bolschwing mentioned. Where did his name come out? Uh, over a while, also, he was involved with coal mining in Tennessee, trying to get people in Tennessee to put money into TCI to keep it going. His name came out when they were trying to deport another Nazi that he helped escape from Romania, from the Iron Guard, this Mr. Trifia. And he, he helped them all leave Romania so they wouldn't be caught or prosecuted. And there's been extradition uh, on Trifia. That's the gentleman that Richard Nixon had give a prayer before the Senate in the United States Congress, this war criminal who had committed so many atrocities in Romania. Now, Pete Carey uses a word in his article, which is interesting, in the San Jose Mercury this week. He said, Von Bolschwing admitted helping Trifia and others of the Iron Guard to escape from Romania in 1941 after the Jewish pogrom. 
pogrom, P-O-G-R-O-M. Pogrom is not used often. That was the rampage in uh, Russia under the czars and in Poland and Eastern Europe where they would tear into homes and kill all the Jews and massacre the families and cut them up and leave their entrails hanging out, rape and kill the women, the wives and the children in front of the parents and just ravage the whole place and leave. There were Jewish pogroms in Romania. When Jack Ruby was interviewed by Chief Justice Earl Warren and Gerald Ford, and he wanted to come out of Dallas from the jail to Washington and tell him who killed Kennedy. He said that he's involved with a group who will put a whole new form of government into power if the truth isn't told. And he said, we will have pogroms in this country. And he knew, and Jack Ruby knew, that he was working with Nazis. And he said, if the truth doesn't come out, we will have pogroms. And these are the people that set up pogroms over in Europe and were brought here. And so far, we can't extradite. Uh, Mr. Von Bolschwing. Otto Von Bolschwing had tried to lie to investigators. They came out to see him. His name came up at the trivia hearings, and they came out to see him in California in February 1981. And they said, finally, and he had lied when he came into the country, but I don't believe, not changing his name, that they didn't know the full truth, just as they knew about Walter Dornberger or Werner Von Braun and other Nazis. They asked him, the investigators, were you a member of the Nazi party? And he said, yes, I was a member of the SS Gestapo. He finally told the authorities. And with these words, according to Pete Carey, in a beautifully written article, Von Bolschwing's life in America crumbled. He admitted that he was a member of the Nazi party and the Gestapo, but that wasn't the problem of von Bolschwing with his rare disease at the stem of the brain given him one year before they come and say, are you a Nazi? Are you a Gestapo? The point of all this is on the anniversary of John Kennedy's death 18 years ago is that J. Edgar Hoover worked with the Nazis and knew that these people were going to set up a another Reich and continue what went on in Germany before the war was over. Alan Dulles, who brought this gentleman over here and brought Reinhard Galen, was on the Warren Commission that decided who killed John Kennedy. Gerald Ford from the CIA working with these Nazis and Richard Nixon lied and covered up the murder of John Kennedy to become president of the United States to absolve Richard Nixon of any crimes in the future, including that of murder if it ever should come out. The Warren Commission was stacked with Mr. Russell, the watch watchdog of the CIA, Senator Russell, and other people that totally lied to the American people. The truth more is more in von Volschwang in this particular article that came out. It does not say what he did those years up till after John Kennedy was murdered. Well, the years that he was in this country and working with Warner Lambert. There are missing pieces, and of course, this is a first article. This isn't a continuous article, and I already, as I say, spoke to somebody who wanted P. Carey to do a book. He has enough here for a series, and if he does it right, and if we get these sheets out that go with these tapes to Congress and encourage him and encourage the San Jose Mercury to keep this going, he will win the Pulitzer Prize for this story. He brought in the big fish and these connections to the Gettys, to judges in the Bay Area, to Ronald Reagan's White House today, to the past people who were involved in the killings of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, to the manipulation of our process, the crimes by which you think you go to office and you select a president of the United States, you select the one they picked a long time ago that they guide their career through, and if anyone's in the way, they're murdered. You had to get rid of John Kennedy to make Richard Nixon, as promised, the president of the United States. Otto's career, according to Pete Carey, was strangled in a web of lies working with the highest levels of American business. But his career is the story of America. It's the story of the United States. It is the story of pretending you don't know he's there. It is the story of the news media in Sacramento, the Associated Press, the United Press, when TCI went over and under and not having his name linked. 
of the Defense Department having security for a person for the highest level of intelligence with his interconnecting links to the Gestapo, to Himmler, to the Argentine Nazis, working in Silicon Valley with those people who want to put you in space stations to take away your rights, your freedom, your voting records. This is the 18th anniversary of the assassination of John Kennedy. I'm glad I carried it to this point. I worked 18 years on this subject, and I think the bottom line is here with people like Otto von Bolschwing and our American intelligence. I'm glad to be able to say that after 18 years, some of us researchers have come this far. That is enough on this one subject. We'll continue it next week, maybe part two on this dog, and fill in some of the pieces that he hints at in the article. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California, and I'll be back with you next week.